This program is made possible by Hay House, an international publisher helping people transform their lives through books, audios, and gifts that inform, enlighten, and inspire. On the web at www.hayhouse.com. In this program, I'm going to be talking about 10 principles. These are principles that I have thought a great deal about. I've given many graduation speeches. I have eight children. I've spoken to them about uh, various things uh, that I think of as my wisdom being passed on to them. But that's not what these principles are about. These 10 powerful principles are the principles that I believe that each and every one of us can put into practice to create for ourselves the kind of life that we'd really like to live. Most of us want to have a sense of peace in our lives. Most of us would like to be able to uh, feel that uh, they're on purpose in their life. But so often we get tied down with uh, trying to fit in, trying to do things the way other people tell us that we're supposed to do them, trying to be a good person, trying to uh, be successful in a material sense. I think the most important thing any one of us can have is a sense of inner peace, a sense of I am a successful human being and I am living the life that uh, I was destined to live, that I showed up here as a person who's a divine creation with a heroic mission. These principles to me represent the most important and significant things that uh, a human being can, can gather into their lives. And they're very practical. They're things that we can use and work on each and every day of our lives. These principles have guided my life since I was a young boy, living in foster homes and earning my own way through everything in my life. These principles work, but they only work if you decide you're gonna make them work for yourself. They're not about being what other people think you should be. They're about living the life that you are destined to live, about fulfilling your own sense of purpose as a human being. They're principles for inner peace, they're principles for success, but they have nothing to do with the material world. They have to do with looking within and connecting yourself to that great source that keeps all of us living and breathing in a fully functioning way. Dr. Wayne Dyer is a best-selling author, lecturer, and modern philosopher. He holds a doctorate in counseling psychology and is America's leading teacher of transformational wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very kindly. We are here in a very special place. We are in the uh, very church where, on the very setting, where Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson's, grandfather, was the minister here when the American Revolution began, and the shot heard round the world was fired just a little ways within walking distance of where we're standing. And it is a very special time for me because in my writing place, which is a very private place, I don't write with a uh, computer, I don't write with a typewriter, I put my left hand on the table and I take my right hand with a ballpoint pen and I have a pad of legal size paper and I allow whatever comes through to come through my heart and onto the page. And in that writing space, I have had a picture of two people on my desk. The two people that have been on my desk have been Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was called by many America's teacher, a man who just uh, took the ideas that he felt burning in his breast and talked about them regardless of what others around might have felt or thought. Uh, he gave an address at the Harvard School of Divinity and wasn't invited back for 33 years because of the things that he said about how he felt man should become self-reliant and how spirituality ought to serve man rather than frighten him. On the other side of my desk is a picture of a man named Henry David Thoreau. 
And Thoreau was a man who decided even to go to prison rather than pay his taxes to a government who was doing some things that at that time he considered an abomination. And he went off to Walden Pond to live and wrote in his journal, simplify, 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 to which Emerson reportedly responded, I think one simplify would have sufficed. <laughs> At any rate, these two giants, along with uh, Bronson Alcott, who was the father of Louisa May Alcott, who wrote Little Women, and so many other powerful uh, books about the rights of a woman to be treated with equality at a time when such things weren't even considered. These were people who took stands on abolition when it was not an uh, easy thing to do. They were stops here along the... Uh, uh, underground Railroad to help people, fugitive slaves who were escaping. These people took these kinds of stands and held meetings at the uh, Concord School of Philosophy to discuss an American approach to contributing something that we call now self-reliance, one of Emerson's most famous essays. And <clears throat> I am honored to be here in the same city on the same site in a building that has been rebuilt, but uh, where Emerson's grandfather was the minister. So Concord was very accommodating to us to put this program together. And what this program is about is what I call my, with apologies to David Letterman, my top ten. <laughs> he does a top ten every night, and of course they're very amusing. These are my top ten principles for... Uh, living a life of, of success and a life of inner peace. I've been invited many, many times to give uh, graduation addresses, in high schools and universities, and I've attended many of them uh, when my own children have graduated, and I've attended uh, at my own graduations at various times in my life. And most of the time, these speeches uh, revolve around certain kinds of themes. One of the themes that they revolve around is success involves working hard and setting goals and listening to your elders and putting aside for the future and all kinds of nose to the grindstone advice about uh, becoming successful later on if you follow these principles. This isn't what this program is about. I have put together what I think are principles that you can live and practice and go to work at each and every day, but these principles don't uh, allow you to become just like everybody else. They're not designed to have you fit in. They're not designed to have you uh, have a life of material success necessarily and defining your success that way, or to feel a sense of inner peace based upon making a connection to something that someone else tells you is what you need to be connected to. These are my principles that I've lived, and it's very difficult for me to tell you to respect your elders and to have other people's opinions be the things that you should use to follow in making your own decisions in life when I've hardly ever done that myself. And I've often said in my talks over the years that... Uh, any success that I have experienced in my life is really in spite of my education rather than because of it. And it isn't because I am uh, putting down education. I've been an educator all my life uh, and a teacher at all levels, from grade school to uh, junior high school, through high school, professor at uh, several universities, and I have lectured extensively all over the world uh, as a teacher. And I never, ever take this responsibility lightly. But I really believe that inside each and every one of us, we must find our own way of fulfilling and actualizing ourselves as human beings. And no one else out there can direct us or tell us how to do that. It has to be something that comes from within. 
One of the books that I read when I was uh, very young was uh, handed to me by a man I respected a great deal. And <clears throat> in it, it was written by Napoleon Hill, and it was called Think and Grow Rich. And it wasn't a book about how to make money and how to get rich. It was really a book that was transformative when I read it at, at the age of 18, which taught how to have a deeper and a richer experience of life. And that the people who are able to have this deeper and richer experience of life were not necessarily those who did things the way they were told to do things. In fact, what they had that seemed to distinguish them more than anything else from those who didn't achieve a measure of success and, and inner peace in their lives was something that he called a burning desire. And this burning desire is something that I can identify with very, very strongly. I am uh, just turned 61 years old. And at the age of uh, 61, I can honestly say to you that I have never really in my life experienced uh, something called scarcity. Uh, I grew up in a series of foster homes. And uh, my life was not one of uh, having things handed to me. I've had to earn whatever I've had to earn along the way. And I've done everything from uh, d drive delivery trucks and work as a cashier. I used to, as a doctoral student, ring out the groceries of, uh, my, of my students when I, that I was teaching uh, and take their bags out and hope that my students would give me a tip. I mean, I've, done, I've been out there working all, right, all my life. But one thing that I've known and I've experienced and I remember from uh, looking at the lives of people who have been able to establish themselves as successful, if you will, is that they have this thing called a burning desire. And a burning desire is not like any other desire. I mean, all of us have desires. I mean, if you want to, uh, if you want to eat your dinner, you have to have a desire to go get the food or move from one room to another or put the food onto a uh, plate and uh, heat it up, or whatever. Desire just comes with uh, being human, being uh, living in a human body. A burning desire is something very different. A burning desire is like having an inner candle flame that never flickers. Though the worst goes before you, this thing can't be put out. No one out there can ever tell you, you can't do this or you can't have this. In fact, when other people do tell you you can't have it or you can't do it, all it does is, for those who have that burning desire, is reinforce that this is something I am going to be able to accomplish. And I will use your skepticism and I will use the doubt that you provide to motivate me even further. And I've always felt that in my life, that uh, even when I lived in a home where there were a group of children. I was the one that always had a little bit of money jingling in my pockets because I would sleep with the snow shovel at night when it would snow. And I'd wake myself up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And I would take that snow shovel out and I would shovel the snow of all of the uh, houses in the neighborhood without even asking anybody if they'd like it shoveled. And then I'd go back and knock on the door and I was cute. <laughs> I was. I was a cute little kid. I had this blonde hair. I know that's hard to imagine. I've sent it all away now. And I would just stand there and say, I shoveled your snow for you. And sometimes I would get a nickel or a dime. I even got a quarter on a couple of occasions. That doesn't sound like much, but uh, that was 1946, 47. That's equivalent to $6,000 in today's money. <laughs> <all right? laughs> and I can remember the other kids always saying, uh, Wayne is the one that had money jingling in his pocket. And it wasn't because... I had any special abilities that the others didn't have. It was because I had this thing called a burning desire to be able to have within me whatever I needed to be able to purchase the things that I wanted. And that burning desire has been something I've, uh, I've had with me, and it's why I put a program together just like this. Because I believe so strongly in the message of public television. I believe so strongly in the idea that uh, we, can, we have a spiritual deficit in this country and that we don't have an information deficit, there's plenty of that, but there's a deficit of spirit, a deficit that says uh, there's not enough of us that feel connected 
to the highest and the greatest part of ourselves. And these top ten principles uh, that I have put together here for this program, uh, you might want to jot down. You might want to go into your uh, desk and just take out a little piece of paper. But I think if you practice them and look at them and see them, they come from someone who's had a burning desire but has also been living a life in which I have felt independent of the opinions of others in terms of whether or not I should or shouldn't be doing that. There's something that I allow to consult myself, within myself, rather than looking outside to see if this is right or not. And so let me just kind of, I'll number them and I'll go through them and I'll give you some examples of them and you decide whether they're to your liking or whether they work or not. The first of these principles came from a, uh, a, a Vedantic scholar on the, in the 10th century. His name was Tilopa. It's, uh, it's not exactly bestseller books, but it's the kind of thing that really excites me because I think of going back a thousand years or two thousand years and reading what some of the greatest minds had to say and how open they were to uh, the potentiality that each and every one of us have for greatness. And this first principle says, as Tilopa put it, have a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing. One of the central principles of my life is that no one knows enough to be a pessimist about anything. And that each and every one of us, when we close our mind to what is possible for us or what is possible for humanity, closes off the genius that resides and lives in each and every one of us. Having an open mind doesn't necessarily mean uh, finding fault with all of the things that you've been taught by others. It means opening yourself up to the potentiality and the possibility that anything and everything is possible. So having a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing really means finding within ourselves the ability to get rid of a trait that I find so common in, contemporary, in the contemporary world. Do you know that most people that I meet spend their lives looking for occasions to be offended? They actually are out there hoping that they can find some reason to be offended. And there's no shortage of reasons. They're out there everywhere. The way this person dressed, the what the worst person said, they turn on their TV, they hear the news, they're offended by this. Someone, didn't, uh, someone used language that they didn't like. Someone doesn't share the same customs that you. And people all day long, in fact, if you keep track tomorrow, you will find uh, probably a hundred reasons that you can go around being offended. But a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing is a mind that says, I'm never looking for anything to be offended by. And that whatever anybody else out there has to say, my response to that is, that's an interesting point of view. I've never considered that before. I remember uh, being interviewed for a uh, morning television show, uh, and the woman that was interviewing me said, how does it feel to be talking to uh, audiences where people have all of these strange beliefs, these weird things that they come to. And it, 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 it intrigues me because one of the, uh, one of the things that, uh, that Emerson said is in one of his very first essays, he says, the first thing we have to say respecting what are called new views here in New England, where we are right now, is that they are not new but the very oldest of thoughts cast into the mold of these new times. And that was in 1842, he was speaking about that. And this woman asked me the question, she said, uh, doesn't it offend you that there's, out, there's people out there and they're talking about people using crystals to heal somebody? And I remember my response. <laughs> my response was that if I've got hemorrhoids and somebody out there is convincing me that <laughs> crystals are going to heal them, I'm ordering crystal chairs. I'm, uh, <laughs> why not? 
I mean, all you have to do is understand something called a placebo. And what is a placebo? It's nothing more than a convincing belief. If I hand you this pill and say, this pill is going to cure your arthritis, and you take it, and the pill is just a sugar pill, but your arthritis disappears, I'm into buying those placebos. Where can I get some of those placebos? And it's true of everything. And it's when you think about all the things that we enjoy and what our life is like, um, it took people who had a mind that wasn't closed to allow us to make the progress that we've made. Progress is, imp is impossible if you always do things the way you've always done things. But the other word in this, what Talopa said, is be attached nowhere. Be attached nowhere. Attachment really means I am deluding myself into a belief that if I can't have or if I can't do this or that thing, then somehow I am going to become immobilized. So an open mind that is detached. In one of, uh, in my most recent book, In a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem, I have a, um, an observation. And it's uh, an observation from Anthony DeMello, a man I respect enormously, a priest, who, um, in The Way to Love, puts it this way. Here's a great test for your relationships, especially the relationships that you're in uh, with uh, those whom you love, not your children, but your spouses and your lovers and, and so on. Try this test on for size. One, I am not really attached to you at all. I am merely deluding myself into the belief that without you, I will not be happy. And two, and here's the toughest test for non-attachment, I leave you free to be yourself, to think your thoughts, indulge your tastes, follow your inclinations, behave in ways that you decide are to your liking. How's that for a challenge? And so what most of us do in our relationships and why they are not as successful as we would like them to be is that we become attached and we tell ourselves that if this person behaves in a way that I find offensive, then I can't be happy. I make my happiness, my fulfillment dependent upon those people that I love being what I think that they should be. And detachment doesn't mean being a victim. It just simply means I know that I can make my life fulfilled and happy by having a mind that is open to everything and attached nowhere. The second principle is a very simple principle. It says you can't give away what you don't have. Now it sounds ridiculous, okay? But it's more than what meets the ear as you hear this. You can't give away what you don't have. People who are not good at giving away love can't give away love because they don't have it to give away. If I want to give you a dozen oranges, I can't give you those dozen oranges unless I go out and pick up 12 oranges someplace. Otherwise, all it is is just empty rhetoric. And the same thing is true of virtually everything in your life. You can't give away love for others if you don't have love in here to give away. If what you have in here is contempt, if what you have in here is anger, If what you have in here is fear, then these are the things you're going to be giving away in your life. And I've often thought, and I really believe very strongly, that uh, there's a law, sort of a law in the universe. I call it the law of attraction. And the law of attraction is one that works like this. You get back from the universe, from the world, what it is that you put out there in the world. And if you're putting out there into the world that I am not worthy of attracting something beautiful into my life, that the universe will respond back to you with exactly that message. And there are people who come to me and who came to me for years when I had a, a, my own a counseling practice and so on, and they would say to me, um, I just keep attracting the same kind of people, the same kind of events, the same kind of uh, losers into my life. 
why is that? Why do I keep doing that? And I keep attracting uh, an absence of, uh, of abundance. I just can't seem to attract abundance into my life. I'm always behind the eight ball. I'm never getting ahead. <clears throat> and I suggest to them, I said, did it ever occur to you that that's the very kind of message you're sending out to the world and out to the universe? That the ocean of abundance is there. And you can go to that ocean of abundance and you can take a Mack truck and you can fill it up 20 times a day and take it out of there and guess what? It doesn't impact at all the ocean of abundance. It doesn't even go down a zillionth of an inch. It's unlimited. Or you can go to the same ocean of abundance with a eyedropper and you can just take this much out once a month and say, that's all that seems to be available for me. And the interesting thing for me is that when people go to this ocean of abundance, this uh, unlimited world, all that I have is thine, it says in the holy books. All that I have is thine. It's all there for you. But if you believe inside that it's limited, that you can only get so much, that other people are going to get it before you do, then you'll find yourself creating that very same thing. And the even more interesting part about this, you can't give away what you don't have principle, is that if your message to the universe is gimme, 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 which is a lot of people's message to the universe. I want this from you, I want that from you, please give me this, I have to have that. That's what their prayer is like, that's what their message is, you know, and they say, I want this from the universe, gimme, gimme, gimme. The universe's response back to that kind of a uh, mentality is exactly the same. The universe will say right back to you over and over again, gimme, gimme, gimme. And you'll find yourself never ever arriving, but always being in a state of striving, always feeling as if you're being neglected, never feeling as if you have enough, always feeling as if you're being shortchanged, because you're constantly under the pressure to give to get back what the universe is demanding from you. And the interesting thing about all of this, the, the irony of this, is that if you shift that and you say to the universe, to the world, how may I serve? How may I serve? The universe's response back to you is, how may I serve you? How may I serve you? And it's very intriguing. When you take your energy and your attention off of what you are demanding from the world and instead saying what can I give to the world and it's really the the basis behind that very famous line of the uh, President uh, John Kennedy's uh, inaugural address ask not what your country can do, ask what you can do for your country and the irony of that is and I've learned that in my own life that when I stopped thinking about what was in it for Wayne Dyer and how much could I get and I began to shift and say, how can I help you? How can I give to you? What can I do for you? And people who write to me, uh, I send them something. When, when I encounter somebody that needs help of some kind, I'm very often just giving that to them. And then I find that it just keeps coming back into my life. And once I shifted that energy off of what can I have into what can I give, it seemed to me that the universe responded back with the very same message. What can I give to you? And the most incredible and wonderful and beautiful abundance has flowed into my life in every way that I can possibly think of. You can't give away what you don't have. So take a look at an inventory of what you do have. How much do you love yourself? How much kindness do you have in you? How much peace do you have in you? How much joy do you have in you? And if you're able to give that away, as many times as you can in a given day, watch and see how much more of that continues to show up and come back in your life. Okay? The third principle is one of my very favorites. It's called, There Are No Justified Resentments. And this is a very difficult principle for many people to get, but one that I believe very strongly in. I was in a group one time, of uh, drug addicts and alcoholics. And I was uh, one of the people that was a sponsor and leading this group. 
And the sign on the wall said, there are no justified resentments in this group. And what I said to that group that, that night was, no matter what anybody says to you here, no matter what kind of uh, uh, anger comes directed towards you, no matter how much hate you may encounter showing up in your life, there are no justified resentments. Meaning that if you carry around resentment inside of you about anything or about anyone, and I'm talking about the person that you lent money to and hasn't paid you back, I'm talking about the person in your life that you feel was abusive in your life. I'm talking about the person who walked out on you and left you for somebody else. I'm talking about all of the things that you have justified in your heart and in your life that you have the right to be resentful about. And I'm suggesting to you that those resentments will always end up harming you and creating in you a sense of despair. I've often said that you, no one ever dies from a snake bite. The snake bite will never kill you. You cannot be unbitten. Once you're bitten, you're bitten. But it's the venom that continues to pour through your system after the bite that will end up destroying you. So now you have to take a look at all of the resentments that you may have in your life. And I'd like to suggest to you that I think there is a wonderful metaphor for this that I have created in my life for how to make this work. And I think that Regis Philbin is the one who's responsible for it. All right? My buddy Regis. There's a show called uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire that has been popular all over the world. I'm in South Africa, it comes on. All right? I was in Australia, and they've got their own Australian version. Um, and in Greece, they have the Greek edition of uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. And basically, this show has two levels that you have to get to. Now, the first level is the $1,000 level. And at the $1,000 level, you basically have to answer a question like, on your hand, you have some digits. Those digits on your hand are called your feet, your nose, your ears, your fingers. Uh, and everybody who ever goes on the show has this horrible dread that they're going to go out on one of those questions, <laughs> right? So basically, in order to get to the $1,000 level, all you have to do is answer five pretty simple, simple questions in order to, uh, to get to the $1,000 level. Now, on this program, the $1,000 level for you in this metaphor means that you will leave with something if you get this. At least get this. This is the $1,000 level. You must send blame out of your life for any conditions of your life. Blame has to go. All right. Now, blame means if you're sitting there with a disease, you say, without guilt, it's mine, I take responsibility for it. This means that if you have been through any tough circumstances in your life, this means if you have a minimal amount of, uh, of financial security in your life, this means if your children don't uh, get along with you, this means that uh, if your neighbors are having, taking up a petition to get you out of the neighborhood, whatever it might be that's going on in your life, you name it, and everybody across the, this great country and across this world has a series of these things that you're willing to say, I am here because of the choices that I have made right now. I'm willing to say that. Even though it's difficult, and we know it's really not your fault, we know, really, there's a lot of people out there who are really bad, all right? But, but you're willing to say, no blame. That's the first level, all right? That's where you understand no justified resentment. And then on the uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire show, there is what is called the $32,000 level. And the $32,000 level is not only an opportunity for you to walk away with a sizable amount of goodies, which you can walk away from tonight in this program. 
but it also is the door opener to multi-wealth. But you got to get to this in order to have an opportunity to move into these transcendent levels, all right? Millionaire spiritual uh, status, all right? You got to get through these next five questions. And this $32,000 question, or level rather, comes to this. It came to me from a quotation that I used in the writing of a spiritual solution to every problem. I read the, uh, a book that was written a couple of thousand years ago by Patanjali, the Yoga Sutras, the aphorisms of Patanjali. And one of those sutras, one of those aphorisms, observations that this brilliant man made almost 2,000 years ago was this. He said, if you become steadfast in your abstentions of thoughts of harm directed towards others, all living creatures will cease to feel enmity in your presence. Now, this translates to blame, pretty basic, no more blame. I'm just not going to assign responsibility to other people for where I am because now I have an opportunity to get rid of it. If I think someone else caused it, then I've got to wait for somebody else to change in order for me to get rid of it, and you might wait forever for that. But if I take responsibility for it, I can do something, including move on, which might be the most important thing to do. But at the higher level, when there are no justified resentments, what you are doing is what St. Francis did, Francesco. What you are doing is you are at a place where you are sending love in response to hate. You are literally saying, no matter what comes my way, I am going to be steadfast in my abstention of thoughts of harm directed toward others. I'm going to work hard at no matter what comes my way, having it come out of me what I want to come out of me, and that is love. And that is a higher energy. And if you can get to that level, Patanjali said, all living creatures will cease to feel enmity in your presence. I have a little girl, a precious little girl. I have six precious girls <laughs> and two precious sons. But I have a, uh, a little girl who is almost 12. And she loves animals like no one I've ever met in my life. I mean, her whole life revolves around animals. And when we walk in the woods, butterflies avoid me, fly away from people around, and they come and they land right on her arm. And it happens all the time. All living creatures. She couldn't have a thought of harm directed towards any living creature. And Patanjali said to us, all living creatures will cease to feel fear or enmity or anger in the presence of those who can send love in response to the hate. That's what I mean when I say there are no justified resentments. What I'd like to do, I'd like to share a little story here with you. It's a very tender story. It was sent to me by someone who sends me beautiful things in the mail. And I call it the Teddy story. And I'd like to read this to you, if I can do it without tearing up. And this story illustrates this as well as anything I've ever seen. There's a story many years ago of an elementary school teacher. Her name was Mrs. Thompson. As she stood in front of her fifth grade class on the very first day of school, she told the children a lie. Like most teachers, she looked at her students and said that she loved them all the same. But that was impossible because there in the front row, slumped in his seat, was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. Mrs. Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play well with the other children, that his clothes were messy, and that he constantly needed a bath. Teddy could be unpleasant. It got to the point where Mrs. Thompson would actually take delight in marking his papers with a broad red pen and making bold X's and then putting a big F at the top of his papers. At the school where Mrs. Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's past records, and she put Teddy's off until last. However, when she reviewed his file, 
she was in for a surprise. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and he has good manners. He's a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy's an excellent student, well liked by his classmates. But he's troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, his mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest and his home life will soon affect him if steps aren't taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy's withdrawn and doesn't show up much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes he even sleeps in class. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem and she was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when her students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful ribbons and, and bright paper, except for Teddy's. His present was clumsily wrapped in his heavy brown paper that he got from the grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of perfume. But she stifled her children's laughter when she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy Stoddard stayed after school that day just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to. After the children left, she cried for at least an hour. On the very day, she quit teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and instead, she began to teach children. Mrs. Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy. As she worked with him and his mind seemed to come alive, the more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the smartest children in the class, and despite her lie, became one of her teacher's pets. A year later, she found a note under the door from Teddy telling her that she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. He then wrote that he had finished high school third in his class and she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he stayed in school and stuck with it and would soon graduate from college with the highest of honors. He assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still the very best and favorite teacher he ever had in his whole life. Then four more years passed and yet another letter came. This time he explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go a little further. The letter explained that she was still the best and favorite teacher he ever had, but now his name was a little longer. The letter was signed Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. But the story doesn't end there. You see, there was yet another letter that spring. Teddy said he'd met this girl and was going to be married. He explained that his father had died a couple of years ago and he was wondering if Mrs. Thompson might agree to sit in the place at the wedding that was usually reserved for the mother of the groom. Of course, Mrs. Thompson did, and guess what? She wore that bracelet, the one with uh, several rhinestones missing, and she made sure she was wearing the perfume that Teddy remembered his mother wearing on their last Christmas together. They hugged each other, and Dr. Stoddard whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, Thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a difference. Mrs. Thompson came with tears in her eyes and whispered back, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. Isn't that a beautiful story? Yeah. That symbolizes there are no justified resentments. Work at reaching that $32,000 level, the place where the only thing you have to send is love, because that's what's inside. And that's the message of our greatest spiritual teachers. That's all they ever had to give away. The next principle I call, don't die with your music still in you. And who better to quote than Thoreau right here in Concord when he talked about some of us hear a different drummer and we must march to the music that we hear. 
but all of you, everybody watching, everybody here in this beautiful parish, all of you have some music playing. And all of you have a heroic mission. There's no accidents in this universe. We all show up here with a purpose. There's an intelligence that is a part of everything and everyone, and all of us are connected to it. And too many of us are afraid to listen to that music and march to it. You out there, I know you have a book you wanted to write. I know there's a composition you wanted to compose. I know there's a song you want to sing someplace. Maybe you want to raise horses out in Montana. Or maybe you want to open up an ice cream shop on Cape Cod. Who knows what it may be. Maybe you just want to travel and see the world. Maybe you want to go into a relationship with someone, but you've been afraid to, but your heart says it's the right thing to do. All of us feel something. And in Leo Tolstoy's famous novel, The Death of Ivan Illich, he asks this question that would be terrifying to me. He says, as he has his accountant from Moscow lying on his deathbed, contemplating the horror of this question, what if my whole life has been wrong? I've known what my music is. It's playing right now. As I stand here in front of you with these cameras and in this place, and as I sit down and write my books and tell the world what I know are my truths, I feel always completely on purpose and fulfilled. And no time will I ever come to the end of my life and say, what if my whole life has been wrong? Whoever you are, whatever that music is, however distant it may sound, however strange, however weird others may interpret it to be, don't get to the end of your life and know that you're going to leave and not have it played yet. Don't die with your music still in you. It's the message of uh, the greatest teachers who've ever walked among us. It's the message I give to you today as one of the principles for success and peace in your life. The next principle I call embracing silence. And embracing silence is not that I say this to you because it's so important to be quiet. What I have learned, I have a dear friend, many of you know, we've put out tapes together, we've appeared on stages all over the world together. He's like a brother to me. His name is uh, Dr. Deepak Chopra, a medical doctor, and a dear and close friend. And whenever anything is going on in my family, if I'm having a problem with one of my children or with my, in my own life, and if I call him up and I'll say, Deepak, or his wife, Rita, I'll say, Deepak, what do you think I should do? He always has the same answer, meditate. <laughs> I'll say, yes, Deepak, I understand meditate, but I said, what do you think? He said, Wayne, go deep inside and meditate. Always meditate. I'll say, will you put Rita on? Wayne, meditate. I'll say, all right. And you know, I've learned a lot in meditation. But what I know most about getting quiet and getting peaceful is this, that there's only one power in the universe, and it doesn't matter what you call it. You can call it soul, spirit, consciousness, God. You can call it Louise. You can call it anything that you want. But as Alan Watts said, you can't get wet from the word water. It's not what we call something that gives it its substance. And this one power, this one force that flows through everything and allows everything to be is indivisible. You can't cut it in half. You can't divide it. It's one. It's knowing the one. And everything in your life is almost always given a division. Male, female, young, old, tall, short, black, white, good, bad, up, down. These are all dichotomies. These are all these splits that we all have in our lives. The whole physical world that we live in and are immersed in, it's always immersed in this division. I used to teach a course at St. John's University in New York, and I used to tell my students when I was trying to teach this principle, anybody who can come to class and bring with them a magnet that only has a North Pole, I'll give you an A in the course. You don't ever have to attend another class. And no matter how thin they would slice that <laughs> magnet... 
There was always the South Pole because the physical world is made up of dichotomies. But we have to learn to fuse the dichotomies. And in fusing the dichotomies and blending the want, that's what silence does for us. That's why embracing silence is so powerful. Because no matter how many times you cut silence in half, it's like zero. You still only get silence. In Zen they say it's the, uh, it's the space between the bars that holds the tiger. And it's the silence between the notes that makes the music. These words that are coming out of my mouth right now come out of the silence. And finding that silence and embracing it means that you go to the place within you that you cannot divide. Just like you can't divide the source, the one, the spirit. You can't divide that either. It's only one. So when you go into your silence and you begin to practice meditation, and you begin to make this a part of your life and embrace silence, what you discover is this is where you'll come to know your source. You'll make conscious contact with your source. I can't tell you how many people that have come to me who have suffered from serious illnesses, who've been giving, given diagnoses that it's terminal and that you can't do it, who have gone out to the wilderness and have decided that I am going to commune with nature. And the transcendentalists, Thoreau and Emerson, they believed that nature was our source and that we were all products of nature. And if you can get back to your source, if you can get back to that feeling of being with spirit, that that's where healing can take place. And I've had wonderful stories of people who've told me that it was when I began to embrace that silence that I began to feel more connected to my source. Embrace silence, because it's a way to come to know God, to know your source. Both are indivisible, and the only experience you can have in your daily life that even comes close to a spiritual awake awakening is silence. The next principle I call giving up your personal history. And I learned it from a man named Carlos Castaneda, who once said that um, one day, he said, I finally realized that I no longer needed a personal history. And just like drinking, he said, I gave it up. And that, and only that, has made all the difference in the world. You know the nice thing about giving up your personal history? Is that if you don't have a story, you don't have to live up to it. All of us have these bags of manure that we carry around with us yeah. called our past. And the people who have done things to us and the events and the circumstances, all of this stuff that we use and we bond to. And we bond ourselves to these wounds of our past and we identify ourselves on the basis of these wounds. And every once in a while we set it down and we reach in there and we smear it all over ourselves. <laughs> and then we wonder, why does my life smell so bad? I don't understand this. <laughs> when in fact... The now, this moment, merging yourself into the now, means that you may have been in a relationship. I had a woman from Holland who came over to see me, whose husband had left her after 25 years. She had four children, and she just had been on the verge of suicide. And she was losing weight, and she was depressed, and she was taking all kinds of drugs for it. And she was getting sicker and sicker because she just couldn't get over it. And she came to a book signing that I was doing at a bookstore down in Florida. And she said, you've got to say something to me. You've got to say something to me that will help me to get over this. And I told her this line. I said, give up your personal history. Merge yourself here now into this moment. And those 25 years are something, if you want to understand how to do it, think of your past as, oh, this hat. And this is your past. Now, you can't just set this thing down over here and walk away from it and give up your personal history because you'll always have it there to look back at. What you do is you pick up your past and you embrace it. You understand it, you accept it, 
as I had to go through these things that I had to go through in order for me to get to this place today. And the evidence for that is that I did. You don't need any more evidence. You did. And then you toss it. You toss it. You embrace it and you toss it. And you merge into the now by giving up your attachment. And some of you have heard me use the metaphor of the wake. Alan Watts talked about the wake is not what drives the boat. The wake is just a trail that is left behind. That's all it is. And so is the wake of your life. And the wake doesn't make the boat go, and neither does the wake of your life, the reason why your life is going in the direction that it is. The wake is a trail that is left behind, and it's an illusion to believe that it is the cause of your suffering or your struggles or your difficulty. Give it up. Let it go. Embrace it. Understand it. Get help doing that if you must. And then move into the now. The next principle I call, it's from a line of uh, Albert Einstein. He said, you can't solve a problem with the same mind that created it. In order to work at solving these things called problems in your life, you have to change your mind. It is your mind where they live. It is your mind that created them. They, there is where you experience them. They're all illusions. You must change your mind. Literally rewrite your agreement with reality. One of the things I had said earlier is that one of the most difficult things to do in the world is to admit that you were wrong. Admitting that you were wrong is nothing more than saying, I have been making choices with my mind that have created things in my life that are not working. And I no longer intend to continue making those choices. I was wrong. You don't have to make a declaration of it. You don't have to go out and feel guilty about it. You just simply say, it didn't work. The relationship that I was in before, I behaved in these ways. I didn't realize that it wasn't working for me. Now I do, and this is where I choose to be now. The secret of a successful relationship is, to me, understanding that you put your attention and your energy in a person on what you love rather than what you don't love. Robert Frost said it so beautifully. We love the things we love for what they are, for what they are. Not for what they ought to be, not for what they used to be, but for what they are. So when you look into the eyes of a person you're in a relationship with, whether it's your children, you catch them doing things right as much as you possibly can. That oftentimes takes a lot of hunting, but you'll find it. <laughs> and when you think that my relationship isn't working, remember, it's in my mind, what am I thinking about that person? And if I could just change my mind and put my thoughts on what I love about this person and keep them there, that makes the relationship flourish. And there are people who go through their entire relationship history with no anger, no hatred, no bitterness, and only love. The next principle is, I call it, treating yourself as if you already were what you would like to become. In other words, you get out in front of your life and you see yourself as having already what you know you'd like to have and deserve to have. My children know how to do this perfectly. I have a daughter who wanted a prom dress, and the prom dress was way outside the budget that I thought a prom dress should be, uh, well, I thought a prom dress shouldn't cost over $20, so I do have a problem, <laughs> right? But <clears throat> I upped it to somewhere around $250, I don't know how much, whatever, to me it was still, more than I paid for my first house, okay? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, she called and said, Dad, this is the only prom dress I could wear. This is the, I've got to wear this prom dress. If I don't wear this prom dress, it's just and on and on and on with this uh, wonderful... You know, I've got a, I saw a wonderful book about how to raise teenage uh, daughters. The title of it is, Get Out of My Life, <laughs> But First, Drive Me and Cheryl to the Mall. All right, that's, a, that's the actual title. It's a good book. 
And so I told Serena, I said, uh, it's just beyond the budget. I've got a certain amount of money that I'm willing to put for it. And she said, but I've already seen myself wearing it. I've already tried it on. I have a picture of myself in the dress in my living room, and I've already showed it to the guy who's taking me to the prom. I mean, it was this whole thing about, and she already saw herself in it. I said, well, if you see yourself in it, then you're going to have to also see yourself as earning the difference between what I'm willing to pay. And she drew up a contract. She went onto the computer, and on the background of the computer, you know where they have these little background things they put on? There was 500 pictures of the dress, all right? (laughs) And she signed a contract and said, I'll babysit, I'll do this, I'll do that, and I will pay the difference. And she did, and she wore the dress, because she understood that you treat yourself as if you already are what you'd like to become. There's a genius in you, you have to treat yourself as if you already were that genius. There's something you're completely capable of. See yourself as already there. Then you'll act upon those thoughts because the ancestor to every action, said Emerson, is a thought. The next principle is called treasuring your divinity. Treasuring your divinity. There's a wonderful observation that I saw from from Emerson in Self-Reliance. It's about trusting your divinity knowing that you are connected to your source, knowing that you are a divine creation and that there are no accidents. He said, a man should learn to detect and watch that gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within more than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. Yet he dismisses without notice his own thought because it's his own. In every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. We often reject our thoughts, and we see the things that we think of as grand and as genius, and we reject them because they're our own, treasuring our divinity instead of being terrified of it, knowing that I am always connected to my source. There is no way that I cannot, because it is in you, and I am in you, and you are in me, and you can never be separated from it. There is no place that this source is not. It grows everybody's fingernails. It beats everybody's hearts. It digests everybody's foods. It opens all the flowers, and you're always connected to it. And finally, the last principle I call, wisdom is avoiding all thoughts which weaken you. You know, every thought has an energy, just like everything else in the universe. And if you have a thought of shame, it will weaken your muscles. And what is your heart but a muscle? If you raise a child to believe in shame and feel ashamed of themselves, every time they think that shameful thought, they will be weakened. And if you have a thought of fear, and if you have a thought of stress, and you have a thought of anguish and anxiety, all of these thoughts and many more are the thoughts that will always weaken you. When you are having a thought that you know is disempowering you, shift it. Shift it to one that is empowering rather than disempowering. And the thoughts that empower are thoughts of neutrality and willingness and love and ultimately thoughts of divinity. And when you see a troubled person who is out there struggling at the highest level of unity consciousness or God consciousness or spiritual consciousness, You recognize yourself in all that you see. There, but for the grace of God, go I. And I am connected to that person. Changing your thoughts. I appeared on The uh, Tonight Show many years ago, several times, quite a few times. And I remember coming home from The Tonight Show, and I was walking along the beach, and they had taped the show the night before, And I was out for a walk, and a woman who lived in uh, the Northeast stopped me, and she said, didn't I see you last night? I mean, how could you be here? I said, well, I flew the red eye, and I was walking along. And She said, you know, we're moving down here. She said, "Um, what are the people like here? What's it like? And I said to her, I said, well, what are they like where you live? She said, well, she said, I I live in a very big city. And she said, "Uh, they're very pushy. And people are not very kind, and they don't have time for you. And she said, uh, it's really not very pleasant. She said, that's one of the reasons I'm leaving there. I said, well, that's pretty much what you're going to find here. (laughs) 
That's basically what the people are like here. On the way back on the same day, someone else who had seen me the night before on The Tonight Show, who had lived in the Midwest, stopped me and asked me almost the same question. She said, you live here? I said, yes. She said, well, my husband and I are moving here and we're looking for a school. She said, what are the people like here? What's it like here? I said, what are they like in, in uh, Chicago where you live? She said, oh, she said, it's the Midwest. She said, people are very friendly, they're open, they open their homes to you, they're very loving, they're very kind. She said, it's a wonderful place. She said, I love there, I'm going to really miss that. I said, that's pretty much what you're going to find here. It's what you expect, it's what you think about that expands. It's what Emerson taught us, the ancestor to every action is a thought. Change your thoughts and you change your world. Change your expectations, and you change around what you begin to manifest and see showing up in your life. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Coming up next, a special bonus segment. Dr. Dyer shares more teachings and stories about success and inner peace. I'm walking on the very grounds that uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, actually walked on in their lifetime. And one of the most important things that Emerson said to all of us is that the whole course of things is to teach us faith. And teaching us faith isn't really about teaching us religion as much as it's teaching us faith in ourselves, a belief that we are connected to something that is greater and grander than all of us, and that which we are connected to is divine, that we are all divine beings, and that each and every one of us ought to really consider very strongly treating ourselves that way at all times in our lives recognizing the importance of, of our own thoughts, reminding ourselves that what we think about is what expands into our lives, and that our thoughts are the most powerful force that we have. They're our connection to eternity, so that each and every one of us should be remembering what Emerson and Thoreau and Louisa May Alcott and so many of those people who lived right here wrote about and talked about and encouraged us to form a transcendent view of ourselves and of our world. One of my very favorite words that uh, was invented by a man who was a great teacher of mine, uh, his name was Carl Jung, he called it uh, synchronicity. And it's a term that reflects sort of uh, a place where you can get to in your life where you can have a collaboration with fate almost, where you can begin to uh, see things showing up into your life just because you were thinking them. And for some of us who are very practical minded, we think, well, that's absolutely impossible. All of these things are just coincidences. But the word coincidence is an interesting word. In mathematics, coincidence refers to angles that coincide. And in mathematics, two angles that coincide are said to be two angles that fit together perfectly. And we have taken a term that means things that fit together perfectly and assume that somehow it's all done accidentally. But in a universe in which there is an intelligence guiding everything, there are no accidents. One of my favorite ways of describing this, uh, I did with a friend of mine years ago on some tapes. Uh, his name was Deepak Chopra. And Deepak and I were in front of an audience in London. And we all of a sudden started dialoguing about how to get strawberry ice cream. And we came up with the four ways to get strawberry ice cream. And they raised in level and consciousness from the lowest to the highest. So the first way of getting strawberry ice cream is to have a thought. Everything always starts with our thoughts. And the thought is, gee, I'd, I'd really like to have some strawberry ice cream. And then you act upon that thought. You get up, you get on your bicycle, you get into your car, you go for a walk, you go to the store, you purchase your strawberry ice cream, and you come home and you say, I've got strawberry ice cream. And we don't think that that's too amazing, but if you really look at it, it's very amazing because that thought is invisible, it's formless, it's internal someplace. We know there's a command center in our brain, 
but we've never seen the commander that's in there who says, I think I'd like to have some strawberry ice cream. So it's a pretty amazing process. Have a thought and then act upon it. The second way to get strawberry ice cream is to have a thought, gee, I'd really like to have some strawberry ice cream. And you stay right where you are. And you send one of your children off to get the strawberry ice cream. And this is a higher level of consciousness because here you are just sitting there having a thought and you just express a word and someone else goes off, gets the strawberry ice cream, brings it back to you, and uh, you think, this isn't too bad a way of doing it. The third way we talked about on stage was the more intriguing way. And the third way to get strawberry ice cream is to have a thought, gee, I'd, I'd really like to have some strawberry ice cream. And then someone walks by, and they say to you, excuse me, is this your strawberry ice cream? And when that happens, you go, whoa, booga, booga, booga. And you call everybody that you know, and you tell them, you can't believe what happened today. I was just thinking about having some strawberry ice cream, and a stranger just walked by, and there it was, and he handed it to me. This is what Jung called synchronicity. And this idea that you have a thought, perhaps it's a thought about a sister that you haven't uh, talked to in five years, and she lives on the other side of the country, and you can't get her out of your mind. And that thought represents an energy. And that energy says, gee, I'd really like to talk to my sister, but I haven't talked to her in a long time. And all of a sudden the telephone rings and there's a feeling in here. And that feeling says, gee, I bet you that's my sister. And you pick it up and sure enough, that's her. That's her calling you. And you th everybody that's out there has these kinds of experiences. You have a thought about something, I can remember one time having a thought about getting my screen doors fixed. And I had been given a hard time at home about get your screen doors fixed. And I just hate fixing screen doors. And I was driving down the freeway and I looked to my left and passing me was a truck that said, we will fix your screen doors. And I thought, this is synchronicity and work. And I followed that truck and I got his number and I called him and I had the screen doors fixed before I even got home that evening through a telephone call. And we often think these kinds of things uh, that we call synchronicity or we call sort of a serendipity or collaboration with fate, that they're accidental. But there's no accidents in this universe. Every thought that you have is a thought that is an energy. And that energy, when it is sent out, connects to something else. And everything in this universe is connected. Every tree that you see in this scene right here, every single bug that's out there, all of the thoughts that you have, all of the human beings, there's a philosophy that says that a butterfly flows his wings in New York, that it affects the winds in Tokyo, all around the world. So that's synchronicity. But there's a fourth way of getting strawberry ice cream, and that's the way that I dream about and think about. It's called unity consciousness. And this is where you have a thought, gee, I'd really like to have some strawberry ice cream and you manifest it. In the scriptures, this is called the gift of fish and loaves, that you live at such a high level of consciousness that whatever it is you place your attention on shows up and you become the creator or the co-creator of your life. But those are the four ways of getting strawberry ice cream. The first is quite easy. You have a thought and you go out and get it. The second is you have a thought and someone else does it for you. That third one called synchronicity that's one in which you can begin to see that when you have a thought, you have the power to attract into your life what you're thinking about, even though you may not be consciously aware of it. You can literally negotiate the presence of what you place your attention on. And ultimately, ultimately, even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. And this means that we all have that capacity to have the gift of fish and loaves in our lives or to manifest what we would like. Basically, there are three levels of consciousness that I like to speak about. They go from low to high. The lowest level of consciousness is what I call ego consciousness. And it's the time when we believe that who we are is our bodies and uh, what we can do and what we have and what other people think of us. We essentially believe we're separate from everyone else and we're separate from what we would like to attract into our life, we're separate from God, and we go through our lives sort of believing that uh, we are so special and so important, more so than others. 
and in competition with others. And then there's a level of consciousness that I call uh, group consciousness. And this may be higher than ego consciousness, but it still causes a lot of problems. This is where we begin to identify ourselves in terms of the groups we belong to. I'm an American, you're a Canadian. I am male, you are female. I'm Republican, you are Democrat. Uh, I am Muslim, you are Catholic, and on and on they go. And ultimately, we create an enormous amount of conflicts and ultimately wars over this group identification. But there's a third level of consciousness, is the one that I've always aspired to and try to teach people to go to, and that's called mystical consciousness, or unity consciousness, or even God consciousness. And this consciousness is one in which um, we begin to see ourselves not as separate from each other, but as connected to each other. And when we see another human being, we see the unfolding of spirit rather than their appearance, what color they are, what shape their eyes may be, what their belief systems or cultures they belong to. That all gets shifted into seeing the connection between all of us. And my friend Ramdas, many, many years ago, tells a wonderful story that illustrates how uh, difficult it is for some people to understand this level of consciousness. And he tells a story of a shepherd. And the shepherd was um, tending to his uh, flock. And a person from this uh, ego consciousness, from uh, another part of the world, uh, approached him. And he said to the shepherd, he said, uh, Would you mind if I ask you a, a few questions about your sheep? And the shepherd said, Why, certainly. He said, Well, tell me, he said, How far would you say your sheep graze or walk in a given day? And the shepherd said, well, I can't answer that question unless you tell me which ones you're speaking about, the white ones or the black ones. Well, this man said, the white ones. He said, well, the white ones walk four miles every single day. We've measured that. He said, that's amazing. And he said, what about the black ones? He said, well, the black ones also walk four miles. Well, he was a little perplexed by that, but he said, uh, well, tell me this, he said, tell me, how much food would you say your sheep would eat in a given day? And the shepherd again said, well, I can't answer your question unless you tell me, are you speaking about the white ones or the black ones? He said, well, tell me about the white ones. He said, well, the white ones eat exactly three and a half pounds of grass every single day. We've measured that. He said, really? He said, well, what about the black ones? And he said, well, they eat three and a half pounds as well. Well, the man just got a little more frustrated. Finally, he said to him, he said, well, in the springtime, at shearing time, he said, how much wool would you say your sheep give? And the man said, which are you speaking about? He said, well, the white ones. And he said, well, we've measured that. He said, the white ones give six pounds of wool every spring at shearing time. And he said, well, what about the black ones? He said, well, the black ones give six pounds also. Finally, the man was beside himself. He just couldn't understand this. And he said to him, I don't understand this. Every time I ask you a question about your sheep, you ask me to divide them into the white ones and into the black ones, and then you tell me they're exactly the same. He said, why would you do that? He said, oh, he said, that may be a bit confusing to you. He said, let me explain. He said, you see all of those sheep out there? He said, yeah. He said, you see the white ones? He said, yeah. He said, I see the white ones. He said, well, the white ones are mine. I was given them, I raised them, and they're all mine. I own all of those sheep. Oh, he said, I understand. And he said, what about the black ones? He said, well, I own them too. And that was the story. And it's the story that uh, I've always been amused by. I remember when I uh, called one of my friends, and he laughed out loud at that story, Deepak Chopra. He said, uh, it got to him. The idea was that we, and from ego consciousness and group consciousness, need to divide everything into colors and into appearances. But there are some of us who understand that those are just artificial divisions and dichotomies. And in fact, everything in the universe is all sharing the same intelligence. We're all one, even though we try so hard to divide them up. <laughs>